Greetings to all of you that are here in the room and those that are online. Thank you for inviting me back. I've been... Uh, <laughs> I've been sitting, sitting beside the phone for a year waiting for your call. <laughs> but this is the church that I served. I lived here. I, I, my dad moved here as a pastor when I was nine. I lived here till I was, this was my church, until I was 35 when I went off to seminary. Then I came back in July of 19 and stayed till July of 21. So when I got the call, I guess it was back in June from Pastor John Sherwood, I was just excited and have been so since. I didn't uh, quite remember what the dress code for preachers were, and I thought I'd be underdressed with uh, jeans and sandals, but I can see I'm overdressed. I guess I should have just worn a bathing suit. <laughs> you wouldn't want to see that, I'm, I'm assuring you. But uh, anyway, thank you, thank you so much. And I do have a word from the Lord for you. Pastor John Sherwood gave me no direction except to find a, a passage with water in it and <laughs> preach from it. So that's what I want to do. So Father, Open our minds and hearts, we would ask. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, we would ask it. Three weeks ago, it was Monday, August the 8th, I had the opportunity to go deep sea fishing. And my response was immediate and it was firm. No, thank you. <laughs> Did that once. Well, that once was many years ago when my dad was pastoring down on the south shore of Nova Scotia, Woods Harbor, and my youngest brother, Conard, now in heaven, and his wife, Debbie, who's here this morning, and my wife, Willow Ann, and I were school teachers at the time, so we made the trip down from here to visit for a few days. Well, there was a lobster fisherman in the church who... Uh, took tourists deep sea fishing in the summertime in, in the, his off season. And he knew we were in town, so he called one evening and said, an American has chartered my boat for tomorrow. Would you guys, would you guys like to go along? And without hesitation, we simply said we'd love to. Well, early the next morning, we were on deck about 7 o'clock, and the harbor, as we pulled out of the harbor, the harbor was smooth, just like glass. And we sailed on out into the deep, uh, and there was quite a swell after we got out of the harbor. And it was fun for a little while. And then an hour or so out, we began to fish. Then both my brother and I began to feel not so good and minutes later, we stopped fishing and started feeding the fish. <laughs> Try not to picture that. And so, and then it just got worse. We went from being afraid we were going to die to being afraid we wouldn't die. We felt that bad. And while this American tourist was catching a trophy fish, my brother Conard and I were laid out in the bow of the boat moaning. And I haven't wanted to hear anyone say to me, let's go fishing since. <laughs> so when I turn to Luke, the third book of the New Testament, chapter 5, which is where we are this morning, and read about an incident where Jesus said to his disciples, what do you say we go fishing? My immediate response is, not me, I don't want to go. But then I read the rest of the story, and I discover, discovered, well, never mind what I discovered, you discover it with me as I read it to you this morning. Uh, maybe you've got it on your phone, maybe you have your book open in front of you to Luke 5, it's on the screen in front of you. Here's what it reads. Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, one day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Do you notice that? Great crowds pressed in on him. Obviously, way back century one, Jesus had problems with the press, 
Would you believe that? <laughs> Verse 2, he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, let's go fishing. Well, his exact words are more like this. Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets and you will catch many fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, we'll try again. And this time their nets were so full they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. Earlier in the passage, did you notice? Simon called him master, but now Peter knows who this is that he's dealing with fell on his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, not, no longer master, now he's Lord. Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the size of their catch, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus, fishing. He said, from now on, you'll be fishing for what? Fishing for people. Well, what's that about? Well, I suggest to you this morning that no doubt fishing for people is best illustrated by the story of Zacchaeus. Now, that would be 26 pages ahead of where we are today, in my Bible at least, Ahead in Luke 19, there's the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector in Jericho, and his neighbor called him a notorious sinner because he was. I don't know if you know about those first century tax collectors. If, if the Roman government said, we want $1,000 from this guy, if he could collect three, he could keep two for himself. And that's what these guys did. They were crooks. Then one day, the Galilean miracle worker came to town and Zacchaeus met Jesus and his life was transformed. That's what happens, you know. That's what happens when people come to meet Jesus. It says Zacchaeus repented of his sins and he promised to give back every cent that he ever stole times four. Imagine that. And the story ends with Jesus saying, salvation has come to this home today, and then Jesus said it. He gave his reason for coming to planet Earth. Right there in that passage, he said, I have come to seek and save those like him, like Zacchaeus, who are lost. I want you to notice that word. You'll hear it several times this morning. Like Zacchaeus, who are lost. Jesus said, here, I've come to fish for people. Now hear me this morning. If God came down from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ to seek and to save those who are lost, and if he left the planet and left us in charge of finishing the task, doesn't it follow, doesn't it follow that we ought to be in the fishing business? Amen. Isn't that, doesn't that follow from this truth? Consider this. Think on this for a moment. Has there been a time in your life when you were more interested in fishing than you are today? Has there been, has there been a time when Cross Point Church was more into fishing than it is today? Think on this. Do you have a Zacchaeus or two in your life, in your workplace? in your neighborhood, in your family. Here's my perception now. Now, this is only my perception, but think with me. Here's my perception of the shift that I see in our world and in our church in the last 10 years and especially in the last three, beginning of COVID through today. Here's my observation. The culture 
has moved further away from the church and from the message of the church. There are not, and, the, and the folk out there in the world looking on, and they're not looking at as much, they're not nearly as inclined to look to us any more for answers than they did some years ago. Many out there, more than ever before, would consider what we do here and what we say here as irrelevant. Many more than used to be. Now, here's my greatest concern. We have to some degree, I believe, myself included, you included, we have to some degree accepted and adjusted to that reality. I believe we have. You say, well, Pastor John, how, how do you think that we have adjusted to this reality of the church drifting away from what we believe, what we teach? And I, I believe it's this way. I believe many of us think like this. Well, what can you do? People have the right to go their own way, and they do. And I see this shift in myself, in myself, as it relates to my own extended family. It's what has leaked into my thinking. I see it at times. It's like this. It's a, well, if the fish aren't biting, what's the point of going fishing mentality? Am I alone on this? Are you with me at all? But as I read the word and I hear Jesus say, let's go fishing, I think he means me. He means all of us, and he means today. So I come with me now, these next moments. I see four practical truths from this old story that will help us all stay on course and accept our responsibility to be in the fishing business. So there are four truths that I have for you. And here's the first one. They're on the screen. They're very simple. Here's the first. Our bait, and bait's important. I have a grandson who doesn't like to dig for bait, doesn't like to dig the worms. So he goes down on the wharf at Beulah Camp where we live, Brown's Flat, and fishes with a bare hook. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, doesn't catch anything, but he likes to fish, right? <laughs> well, if you don't have any bait or the right bait, you're not likely to catch much of anything. Here's my point. Our bait must be the Word of God. Now, I take you back to verse 1. Here's what it reads. One day, Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to stories of his childhood growing up in Nazareth. Is that what that says? It's not what it says, is it? No, they, they pressed in on him to listen to Jesus tell stories of miracles that he had performed so far in his ministry. Is that what it says? No. Well, does it say the crowds pressed in on him to listen to Jesus tell about his walking tour of the Galilee region? No, it doesn't say that. It says that the crowds pressed in on him to listen to, what's it say? What are the four words? Word of God. The word of God. That's, now, hear me today. That's what people desperately need to hear today, even if they don't think they need to hear it. They do need to hear it. But there are... There are so many voices out there vying for our attention these days. I think more than ever before, coming at me all the time. I'm desperately in these days eliminating my intake of all the voices, all them talking heads every day, all day, right? Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, so many words, so many opinions, politicians, celebrities, sports figures, yes, pastors too. And you have 24 hours. Who would have thought of this 50 years ago? Are you kidding me? 24 hours news channel? Who needs it? Not you and not me. 24 hour sports channels. 24 hour weather channels. Do you know people sit and watch the weather channel by hours, by the hour? <laughs> Just over indulged, over informed, right? 24 hour religious channels. Vision TV, talking heads everywhere, too many words. And we all need to, I believe all of us need to lessen the barrage of words coming our way. Now, as I stand here this morning and speak, more words, here we go. 
Really, though, you don't need to hear what I think. You, and I know I've been telling you what I think, but I'm getting there. Stay with me. You don't need to hear my opinions. I've shared some of those already, but hear me today. You really do need to hear the Word of God. And, and I'm getting there now in a moment. The, the Gospel of John records an incident in the life of Jesus where he was teaching hard truth. He was coming down on his disciples saying, listen, it's not going to be a bed of roses if you follow me. Matter of fact, if you follow me, you may have more trouble than people that aren't going to follow me. And, and the scripture says, it's in John 6, 66, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and said, so are you out of here too? Simon Peter replied, Lord, Lord, to whom would we go? You alone have the words that give eternal life. Do you believe that? And I stood out here in the, your cemetery last week of June for Bob Tweedy's homegoing service. Oh, about 35 or so gathered there. And, and I spoke to them. I spoke to them the word of God. I told them that Christianity was birthed in a cemetery. I told them that on the first Easter day, Jesus came alive out of a cemetery, out of a tomb. I spoke Jesus' words when I said this. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. And, and I, why did I say that? Because I knew that's what they needed and wanted to hear. And I knew it was the word of God. And that's our bait. That's our bait. Now here's more of God's word that people so desperately need to hear. I'm just picking two or three random words. The world so desperately needs this. This one. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Now, is that a good word or what? And that's the word, that's the word of God. How about this one from Disciple John? For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's the word of God, and that's a good word, and it's the only word, hear me, it's the only word that ultimately matters. Other words coming from our educators, coming from our health people, coming from government, whatever. I'm not saying they're all bad words, but many of them are... They're okay words, but listen to me. They're Band-Aid words. They're, uh, they're helpful, some of the words. They're coming out. They're helpful, but they're temporary. God's words are cure words for what's wrong with this old world. So if we're going to catch fish, if we're going to catch any fish, our bait has to be the word of God. Here's number two. I have four. And I noticed the order they gave me said somebody's going to start playing a keyboard at 11.02. Whoa, I better move. Here's, that's what it says right on the sheet. I'm just, keyboard, 11.02. Stay with me, okay? Listen to me. Willow Ann says, don't say listen to me so much. They're listening. Hey, I taught school for 12 years and no one listened, okay? So... Here's number two. We need to have a passion for the lost. There's that word again, lost. It's not my word. It's Jesus' word. We need to have a passion for them. Now, you remember verse one, don't you? Jesus, Jesus, great crowds pressed in on him. Now look at verse two. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets, stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water, so he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. See it? Jesus' love for people, his passion to reach them, drove him to do whatever it takes to reach them. 
Now picture this. The crowd was so big and so close that Jesus got pushed to the water's edge. So he's probably is up ankle deep in the water and the crowd is immediately in front of him. And so Jesus, knowing the physics of this whole thing, asked if he could sit in the boat of the guys that were mending their nets and pushed off a little bit. Because if you know the physics of it, you ever notice how sound travels over water? Out in my kayak, I learned this the hard way. Don't be talking about people on the beach. <laughs> when you're out in the kayak, they hear every word you said. You know? I'm out there talking to my daughter and look at that. If I looked like that, I wouldn't be wearing a bathing suit on the beach. And the guy's looking at me like... So Jesus knew. Jesus knew that if he just got in a boat and pushed out 10 or 15 feet, the sound would carry. Well, what's the big deal anyway? Why the big effort to be heard? I mean, Jesus taught every day. So why make this kind of effort? Why not tell the fringe of the crowd who couldn't hear him, just go away and come back another day? You know why, don't you? Because Jesus had a passion to reach lost people now. He did. Because Jesus saw people as lost. That's a hard word, lost. Without hope. He saw Jesus without purpose and without meaning in their lives. Do you? Do I? One of the Bible's best known stories is about a man who had two sons. By the way, Jesus told this story in response to a query from the crowd inquiring of what God is really like. We call it the prodigal son. It should be titled the loving father. And so he told the story. The man's two sons, one rebelled and said, I want my inheritance now. I want to go my own way. I'm tired of all the rules and expectations around here. And the father agreed and gave him his inheritance and let him go. And the boy lived the good life. The Bible says wild living. Some would call that the good life. People that are living that life, they think it's good. Don't fool yourself in thinking people out there aren't having fun. They most certainly are. But anyway, the Bible says he lived that way, and then his money ran out, and shortly after his money ran out, his friends ran out too. And he was destitute. He found a job in a pig farm. And then the boy finally came to his senses, according to the story, and said, you know what? My dad's hired men back home have it far better than me. I'm a going home. And he practiced his I'm sorry dad speech all the way home. And the Bible says, love this part of the story. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, you notice the father ran, embraced him, and kissed him. He didn't even, the father didn't even know but that the kid was coming home to beg for more money so he could go live some more wild. Didn't matter to the father. <laughs> his father said, go get a robe, go get a ring, go get sandals, kill the calf. My son's home. He was lost. Now he's found. And a party began. And that's that is my favorite picture of God the Father standing on the front porch, scanning the horizon, passionately hoping that his lost son would return. You want to know what God is like? That's what he's like. So my question for you, and it's also for me, is do I have a passion like that to see Lost people come home. I'm on staff at King's Church down the road, St. John area. Three weeks ago, we had our annual uh, staff retreat. And Pastor Brent Ingersoll, great leader. What a man. He's a, he's a CPer. He's got family all over the place down here, relatives. Love working for him, love working with him. Here's what he said, and I'm quoting him here. The Lord would like to renew 
our personal zeal and passion for the gospel. He said he wants to renew our heart for the kingdom and for the salvation, and then he used the word, for lost people. And then he made, then he made this admission. I admired him for being so transparent. He said, it sometimes strikes me as how numb I can grow to the value of a person's eternal destiny. What is he saying? Is that I, I don't like to think about it. Then he said, I once heard a well-known agnostic, his name was Penn Gillette, talk about how moved he was by a believer who had given him a Bible. What he said convicted me, Pastor Brent said. If all the people, Gillette says, if all the people really believe what this book says, you would think there'd be more people out there trying to see people saved. Obviously, not everyone takes it too seriously. Ouch. Then Pastor Brent said, I am praying in this season that the Lord would increase my burden for lost people and that, that they would come to know the love of the Father, salvation through Christ. And then he spoke to us, 34 of us there on staff. That's not just, that's East Campus, West Campus, Halifax, Charlottetown, and St. Stephen. And he spoke to us and said, Spend some time asking the Lord to place some added weight of the pricelessness of a human being and the urgency of their eternal destiny. Will you pray that too? If we're going to catch fish, we'll never even stay at it unless we have a passion for them. Here's number three. I have four. I know 10.02 is coming. Oh, my, it's 10.01, 11.01. You're not really going to head for the keyboard, are you? <laughs> I wasn't up on time, by the way, I don't think. Here's number three. If, if fishing's going to work, if we're going to really catch fish, here's number three. We've got to all get involved. I mean, everybody. For too long, we've said, my church has a passion for lost people. My pastor has a passion for lost people. We'll never get the job done if that's the extent of it, unless we're all involved. That's right. Verse 6. In this time, their nets were so full, they began to tear, and a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. What they, they just said, hey, guys, we need some help over here, and I'm saying to you today, hey, everyone, we need some help over here. And it goes on to say, you don't have this in front of you. Soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. And when they shouted for help, it says their friends came a-running, uh, a-rowing. <laughs> right? We can all get involved in the fishing business, you know. I know there are some here saying, oh, Pastor, I have trouble speaking about my faith. In 1972, 50 years ago, NASA launched the exploratory space probe Pioneer 10. Its main mission was to reach Jupiter and send back information about that planet. It was a bold plan because at that time, no satellite had ever gone beyond Mars. I think Jupiter's the next one out, isn't it, from Mars? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. I think it's Jupiter. I'm not sure. I should have done that research. Anyway, it swung past Jupiter just a year and a half after it went out. And then it went past Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And by 1997, 25 years later, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. 6 billion, I can't even think numbers like that. Despite that immense distance, Pioneer 10 continued to beam back radio signals to Earth, and the last signal that we received from Pioneer 10 was in January of 2003, 31 years after. Here's the remarkable thing. Those signals were powered, hear this, by an 8-watt transmitter, 8 watts. That, that's about as much power as your kid's bedroom nightlight. Not even the most optimistic scientist could have ever imagined what that little 8-watt transmitter could do. 
Maybe you're ahead of me on this, but listen. So when you and I say to God the Father, help me, I'd like to fish more than I do fish. If we offer ourselves to God in faithful obedience, it's, in, it's incredible what God can do with a little 8-watt transmitter. It's incredible. Like you and me, we just need to be turned on for him. The agnostic I spoke about a few minutes ago that Pastor Brent told us about, Penn Gillette, was moved, deeply stirred and touched by an 8-watt believer who simply gave him a Bible. It wasn't some megawatt super church pastor. It was just an 8-watt believer. And all down through the centuries, there have been 8-watt believers that have made a huge impact. Did you know that? Well, let's start with Andrew. Andrew was one of the very first disciples called by Jesus. And as soon as he met Jesus, he whirled around and went and found his brother, Peter, and simply said, we have found the Christ, come take a look. That's pretty eight watts, don't you think? And Andrew brought the leader of the early church to faith in Jesus Christ. Just an eight watt word. Our church, maybe yours is too, offering Alpha this fall. So simple. You say to the guy you work with or to your neighbor, would you come to Alpha with me? It's just an eight-watt invitation. That's all that is, but it can change a life forever. We can all get involved, you know. I've come to realize in recent days that I have family members I have family members for whom I'm the best, their best chance at ever coming to Jesus. Well, you're a pastor. Of course you are. No, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm family and I have an in. And your pastor isn't the best chance for your relatives to come to Jesus either. You are. But you know what I get... I get caught in sometimes. Maybe you don't. Maybe this is just for me. I'm concerned that family members who are close to me, who seem at this point to have no interest in matters spiritual, will take offense. They'll take offense if I speak to them. But, but listen, if we rarely say anything, won't they conclude it can't be that important if we never mention it? Right. We've all got to go get involved in this fishing business. And here's the fourth point. Come on, Ruthie, you can start to play now. I'm, I'm getting near. Don't play over me so they can't hear me, though, okay? Here's number four. We'll never give up. Never. Now I'm going back some verses. We skipped some. Back to verse four. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon... Now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets and you will catch many fish. Simon, Master Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't get your thing. But if you say so, we'll try again. Peter is saying fishing, where we're, fishing is a waste of time. And they're not biting. We may as well give up. But then he said it. But if you say so, Jesus, we'll try again. Well, hear me this morning. He says so. He says so. He says we're to keep fishing and never give up. He says try again. I've pastored in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia twice. I went there in 83, stayed till 01, went back 12 years later and from 13 to 16. When I went there in 83, Ruth, Ruth was a faithful attender and hard worker in the church. Her husband, Doug, was a nice guy. He was a C&E guy, Christmas and Easter. And maybe occasionally other times, if it was a special occasion. He was as cool and as distant. I, I couldn't get anywhere with him. I couldn't even get him alone. He avoided me. He was not interested. And I stayed for 18 years, as I mentioned. And, and in 2001, I left. 
And 12 years later, in 2013, I went back. And Doug was gone. Doug had died. And and my heart sunk. And then, in my first days back, Ruth, I could see her coming, made a beeline for me. And she said, Doug got it right with God before he left. <laughs> Ruth, Ruth loved on that guy and prayed on that guy for 40 years and never gave up. Verse 6 says, and this time when Peter tried again, when he went back out, their nets were so full they began to tear. And the message is simply, don't ever give up. If God doesn't give up, why should we? So here's my question. Who have you given up on? We must never give up. And here's the why. And I'm going to ask you, put all three of those up on the screen at once. Here's why we must never give up. I think we've moved away from this a little bit, especially number two. Do you know why? Like, because I can hardly stand the thought of someone I dearly love ever going to a place called hell. But look at these three things here. People are lost. There's the word again. That's not my word. That's Jesus' word. And look at number two. Hell is real. Jesus spoke twice as much about hell as he ever did heaven. And here's number three. Jesus Christ is their only hope. It was Jesus who said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe that? Do you believe these things? They're Jesus' words. They're not mine. Let's go fishing. Would you pray with me? Father, I've been asking for myself and I'm asking for all of those here in this place this morning, in this room, and those listening online. Give us a new passion for people that don't know you. Give us a sense of urgency. Help us to find ways to start, for many of us, it's to restart a conversation that we kind of dropped years ago. Help us to realize, Father, your words, people are lost. That hell is a real destination. And that Jesus Christ is their only hope. Help us, Father, to be about your business. And your business is fishing. In Jesus' name, I pray it. And all, all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. This morning. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And cause his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you and give you peace. God bless you. Thank you.